But let's let Paul now speak for himself. And again, I could have quoted a hundred verses for you. We'd be here for all week. I just selected a few. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I'm sorry, that's Romans chapter 3. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, you are not under the law. law well, again, law for him means Torah. In Greek, the word law is nomos. Nomos is the Greek translation of Torah. So Paul says you are not under the Torah, but under grace. For the law of the Spirit in the life of Messiah Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Again, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, for the Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Paul, faith in the Messiah replaces performance of the mitzvot. He writes in Galatians chapter 3, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. I like to, I would translate, anyone have a bike when they were kids with training wheels? Right, you had a two-wheel bike, but you couldn't ride a two-wheel bike, so you put on training wheels. That's what he's saying. He's saying the Torah was our schoolmaster. It was a training wheels to do what? To bring us to faith in the Messiah, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. We throw away the training wheels. We don't need them anymore. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty with which Messiah has made us free, and not to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, if you be circumcised, Messiah shall benefit you nothing. Okay, as the Apostle Peter pointed out earlier, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, that Paul speaks about things that are hard to be understood, or in other words, complicated matters, which uh, the unlearned and unwise will rest as they do with other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, it's a sad fact that uh, the bulk of Christianity does not understand Paul very well. And um, it has turned into this popular movement, which is the bulk of what we call Christianity. It's a popular movement. People are in it for different reasons. Um, but there's a very small part of Christianity that actually understands what the doctrine actually is. So, um, now let's look at Paul in Romans and answer Rabbi Skovic's um, assertions that he has made about Paul's words. Now, the first thing I'd like to point out, in Romans chapter 2, say starting in verse um, verse 6, and he's saying uh, in the previous verse, he said, God, who will render to every man according to his deeds? So there is a, that's, that fact is reiterated throughout the Christian scriptures. Verse 7, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. To those people get eternal life. But to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they get indignation and wrath. Okay, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentiles. But glory, honor, peace, to every man that works good of the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. What does he mean that by the Jew first? Because the Jews received the oracles of God first, but now it has gone to the Gentiles. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without the law, 
shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which, ha which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these, not having the law, are a law unto themselves. So what's that mean? It means if a Gentile has never ever heard of the law, but he does the things that are in the law, then he shall be judged as righteous by God, even though he doesn't know the law. He's a law unto himself. Okay, uh, which, now carrying on what Paul said, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Because it's written in his heart. He's, he's following his heart, and if the law is written in his heart, then he's doing the law, even though he doesn't know the law. Their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing, or else excusing one another. So within their own heart, he's accusing and excusing his own thoughts, and he's guided by his heart. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So right there Paul is saying that those who do the law shall be judged as righteous by God, and those who do not do the law shall be judged as unrighteous by God. So that's where Paul's starting his, his thesis here. Okay? And you got to remember, he's talking, this letter is to the Romans. So these are very self-righteous people. These Romans, they thought, what are you talking about sin? I didn't sin. They thought that they were the exceptional people. Okay. So then he, then he goes on talking about the Jews from there. He says, Behold, you are called a Jew, and rest in the law, and make your boast of God. And you know his will, and approve the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And you are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and the truth in the law. You, therefore, that teaches another, don't you teach yourself? You that preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You that say a man should not commit adultery, do you do you commit adultery? Do you, you, you that abhors idols, do you commit sacrilege? So he's going on to say, uh, You make your boast of the law, through breaking the law, you, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For si so, um, the, he's talking. He's not talking about every Jew. He's talking about Jews who are not keeping the law, but boasting about being a Jew. Oh, I'm a Jew. But he's not keeping the law. God is being blasphemed through you. Okay, then he concludes, circumcision pro only profits you if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Therefore, if uncircumcision keeps the righteousness of the law, Shall not his uncircumcision 
be counted as circumcision. So if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteousness of the law, then shouldn't he be considered as circumcised? If a circumcised man keep, does not keep the righteousness of the law, he's considered uncircumcised. So if an uncircumcised man does keep the righteousness of the law, he should be considered circumcised. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfills the law, judge you who by the letter and circumcision transgresses the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. It's not listed here in the uh, verse, in the uh, cross, in the notes, but I remember that, I think it was Isaiah that said, uh, circumcise your hearts. There is a circumcision of the heart in the Tanakh. <clears throat> so Paul's uh, referring to that. The saying circumcision, the true circumcision, is of the heart. And for the very reasons we just spoke of. So now, he, in chapter 3, he goes on, he says, What advantage then does the Jew have? Or what profit is there in circumcision? He says, much in every way chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. So what some of the Jews did not believe. Does their unbelief make the law of God of no effect? Okay, God forbid. Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou might be justified in the sayings, and might overcome when you are judged. So, but anyway, I just uh, show how Paul's view of the law is. The law is the definition of sin. It defines sin. Do not do this. Do not do that. Do not do this. That's that's the definition of sin. Okay. Now, uh, now he's talking to the Jews again. He says, "What then? What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles." that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. So, is he saying there are no righteous people on the earth? No, he's not saying that. He's not talking about that. He's saying there's no righteous, pure, righteous nation on the earth. The Jews have righteous and unrighteous people, and the Gentiles also have righteous and unrighteous people. This is what he's this is the point he's making. And he's proving his point by showing that there was a time in Jewish history, in Israel's history, where God said, there is no righteous, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that, do, that does good, not one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ass is in their lips. Now this is a, a collective... He goes on with more. It's a collect 
It's a collection of verses out of the Tanakh showing instances where there were unrighteous Jews and the nation was unrighteous. So he's showing that the Jews have righteous and unrighteous people and the Gentiles have righteous and unrighteous people. So all are under the law. Okay. So continuing in verse 19. Now we know that what things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. It's not saying all the world is guilty. It's saying all the world could become guilty before God because of law. So not only the Jews are, are, are charged to keep the law, the whole world is charged to keep the law. And if you break the law, then you become unrighteous that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh is justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, by doing, um, by the deeds of the law, what are the deeds of the law? Well, do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not kill. Well, if you do those deeds, no flesh is justified. Whether you're a Jew or not a Jew, you are not justified. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. So in the Gentiles, now the righteousness of God is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ to all of them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned, all meaning all the nations of the world, have sinned, have people who have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ, who God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So this is the Jesus Christ for the nations is taking the place of the Levitical priesthood in the Jewish in the Jewish nation. And not only in the Gentiles, he's also taken the place of that position for the Jews because of the destruction of the temple. Jesus foretold, not a stone shall be left upon a stone in the temple. Um, and this is because it's a rejection, not of the Jews per se, it's a rejection of that system, that system that was set up under Moses. That is over, and now the new system is being put, is put in place that it's under Jesus. Faith in Jesus is the, is the, uh, the flowers, as the rabbi would put it, okay? To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. So Jesus declares God's righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Where is the boasting now? Is there Jews who now boast? It is excluded. By what law? 
of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. <clears throat> now, okay, he's justified by faith in Jesus without the deeds of the law of Moses. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, he's the God of the Gentile too. Seeing it is one God, one God, which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid! We establish the law because it's faith that it is your your guilt that leads you to faith and your faith that forgives you for breaking the law. So now let's take a look at the verses that Rabbi uh, showed. Uh, Romans 3.28. Well, we just did that. He said, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Well, that's what Paul was saying. Okay. Now, uh, Romans 8.2. We've already touched on this. Um, when Paul was saying earlier... Paul was saying earlier in, in Romans chapter 7, I do the things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I want to do. Therefore, with my mind, with my mind, I glorify God, but with my body, I break the law and I sin. So now it is no longer me breaking the law because my heart is for God. But my body is not for God. So now he's this 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 conflict within him. So then he goes to say, I thank God through Jesus Christ. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So now he's talking about walking in the spirit in chapter eight. So how do you walk in the spirit rather than walking in the law, okay, or walking in the flesh? There is no condemnation to them which are in Jesus Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So what's the... It doesn't mean the law of sin or death. The law of sin and death no longer exists. It does exist. The law of sin and death, is, that law says, if you sin, you shall die. That's the law of sin and death. But the law of the spirit of life says, if you believe, you shall live. That's the law of the spirit of life. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, it was weak through the flesh because the flesh has all these desires that conflict with the law, and the law is not able to get rid of those desires. It just, it, they, they keep coming back, okay? God sends his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Now you see, um, I was thinking about this. It's like under the old covenant, the law is like a ceiling is you have to try to reach that mark. You have to try to get above this, this ceiling. Well, 
in Christianity, that same ceiling becomes a floor. Is when 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 through Christ you are above the law. You become above the law through your faith, and that that law now becomes a floor. That as long as you walk in in the spirit and keep law, then that's a floor for you. But if you break law, then you fall through the floor. Then you have, but then you have your faith in Christ to bring you back up, and in repentance, to again become a keeper of the law. So it's like walking in spirit versus walking in the flesh, as saying, "Well, I have done all these things," and denying the those those evil desires that are within your flesh. Um, that see, Jesus expanded the law, saying that even if you think about coveting, you are coveting. Or even if you think about adultery, you're committing adultery. So it's um, a much, much, a much expanded position. <clears throat> it's a, it's a much expanded law that comes with an expanded help. Okay, what's the other verse? Romans 10.4 We're just breezing over these things right now. Okay, take a look at, okay, he, he's speaking in in verse in, in chapter nine, he's speaking that his heart is broken for his own people, the Jews. He's a Jew. He's he's broke. His heart's broken for them um, because they can't see this this awesome thing that God is doing. Okay, and then in verse ten, brethren, my heart's desire. Or in I'm uh, sorry, in chapter ten, in chapter ten, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That they don't have the knowledge of of what we were just talking about. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. So they they they're not believe they won't believe in Jesus, and they're trying to establish their own righteousness as law keepers, rather than submitting to the righteousness that God has provided for them to follow. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes because you don't get your righteousness from keeping the law but you get unrighteousness from breaking the law you get your righteousness from God, from Christ unrighteousness comes from breaking the law for Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this way, Say not in your heart who shall ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend to the deep, that is to bring Christ again from the dead, but what does it say? The word is nigh to thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the condemnation of the law. So the law is holy and just and good. It's not removed. It's not destroyed. It's it's there to condemn 
sin. So that's what Christians mean, mean by saved from sin. Saved from the unrighteousness of being held guilty by the law. Now, the law doesn't provide a way for you to get out of that, especially the, the laws regarding uh, death, the death sentence. The law does not provide a way out, but Jesus does and gives you another chance to walk in the righteousness of God. Okay, so that's what Romans is talking about. Now he also talked about Galatians. We'll take a quick look at that. Galatians. <clears throat> Chapter 3, 24 to 26. <clears throat> now, usually when somebody's quoting a scripture, it's a good idea to go a little ahead of it and a little behind it to get the context of what the scripture is talking about. Galatians 3.24 Okay, the law was our schoolmaster, okay? <clears throat> okay, so he's saying, okay, we'll start in verse 19. Wherefore then serves the law? It was added because of transgression. Okay, we'll go back a little further. <laughs> we'll start in verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, okay, so he's saying, okay, um, God gave Abraham this promise. And this promise is a covenant between God and Abraham. And that covenant that was confirmed before of God, by God, in Christ, is this is the covenant saying, and through you all nations shall be blessed. Okay? The law, which was 430 years later, cannot disannul that covenant that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance comes from the law, it isn't, it isn't a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. See, the law isn't a promise. The law says those who do, those who do the law shall live by it. That's not a promise. It's work. It's, it's receiving re the, the just reward for your work. A promise is a different thing. Okay, so then he goes on in verse 19. There, wherefore then serves the law? What's the law for then? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. The mediator is Moses. Okay. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. See, as soon as you have a mediator, then you have two. You have God, then Moses, then the people. So that's not one. That's not directly from God. But God is one. Okay. Is the law then against the promises of God? No. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, then righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise of faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So the, 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 the law was brought in to 
condemn the world of sin. It was brought in to condemn sin in the world. On all nations, not when he say in all, he 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 means not only the Jews, but the Jews and the Gentiles. The whole world is under law. It doesn't mean that there are no righteous people on earth, but righteousness is defined by the law in the whole world. So, but before faith came, we were kept under the law. So before Jesus came, we were under the law. Um, the Jews were under the law. And the law had the, uh, the ordinances and the statutes and all these things around the law that was a, a teacher of the faith that was to come. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after the faith came, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, it doesn't mean the law is no longer valid. The law still defines sin and guilt. Sin. And brings guilt. But the... The ordinances of sacrifice are no longer the schoolmaster. Christ has replaced those things. But he hasn't replaced the definition of righteousness. For you are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew or Greek, there is neither bond or free, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now Galatians 5, 1 and 2. Okay, we can start right from verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty that Christ has made us free, whereby Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage, serving this guilt and sin in your body that keeps uh, bringing up these temptations that and you and and the law is there and you're working hard to keep the law and um, this is the yoke of bondage it's not the law that's a yoke of bondage it's sin that is the yoke of bondage you see Christ has made us free do not be entangled again. Now he's talking to the Galatians who are being told to get circumcised and keep the law of Moses. You're going, you are free and now you're going into bondage. Bondage of that schoolmaster. Okay. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say to you, if you be circumcised, now these are not Jews. These are, these are, Galatians. These are Gentile, Greeks. And now they are already Christians. And they became Christians when they were uncircumcised. So if you become circumcised, then you are leaving Christ and going to Moses. You're going backwards. You, 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 Moses was the schoolmaster. Christ is the 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 uh, the reality. Okay. Okay. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, 
that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You are in debt to do that whole law, all of it, all the time. Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever you are who are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. See, so this is a, a, through Christ you are, um, you have attained the remission of sin. But the law is still there to define sin if you do the things that the law says not to do. And it's still a schoolmaster in, in, in many ways. It, it's like for Christians, the law is still a schoolmaster because we um, find ourselves in situations uh, where we do break the law and we do face guilt in our conscience and we do turn to God for help. So it's still a schoolmaster in, in, uh, in that way. But um, when he's saying it's a schoolmaster, he's talking about God um, inserting his knowledge into the world. It started with Moses, and that was a schoolmaster to teach the oracles of God. Now Jesus is a working out, like a hatching of the teachings of the oracles of God and breaking out into the whole earth. It's the knowledge of God surrounding the whole earth and not just Israel or not just that land or that one nation. So that's that.